It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Temiskaming Park. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Solicitor General agreed the political campaigning by the former Peterborough Police Services Board Chair was wrong. The man is the MPP's friend, vice president of his riding association, and is the MPP's so-called wingman. The Solicitor General said, and I quote, the police services board member in question did do something inappropriate and tendered his resignation, which of course we have, we have accepted, end of quote. Does the Premier agree it's inappropriate for a chair of a police service board to campaign for the PCs? Uh, government has to Mr. Speaker, I guess you know uh, you're coming towards the end of, uh, of a session when the NDP start to sink even lower, Mr. Speaker. Look, uh, Speaker, I, I understand this is where the NDP have. They, they, they don't want to talk about the economy because uh, uh, we are seeing changes that are really unleashing the power of the Ontario economy. They don't want to talk about health care because we're making so many important investments uh, in health care. They don't want to talk about long-term care because they know that we've made Actually, enormous investments uh, in long-term care, Mr. Speaker. Look, the reality is that Ontarians elect a strong, stable, uh, progressive conservative majority government in 2018 to get the job done. Uh, speaker, and they also know that in order to continue on the progress that we have made over the last uh, four years, the only way to do that is to continue to elect a strong, stable, progressive conservative majority government on June the 2nd. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. By judging by that answer, it's obvious they didn't want to answer the actual question. Speaker, in 2018, the Premier appointed longtime PC donor Ron Chatha to the Peel Regional Services Board, Regional Police Service Board. He is now the board's chair, and the Premier just reappointed him in December for another three year term. But on April 3rd, the Premier had Mr. Chatha with him at a campaign event in Brampton. Speaker, if it was wrong for Peterborough's Police Services Board to, champ to campaign for the PCs, just as wrong for the Premier to campaign with the Peel Services. Board Chair, does the Solicitor General, a member from the Peel region, agree that this is also inappropriate and what action is she going to take to address the matter? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. I think for the purposes of clarity, we should review exactly what the process is for individuals who want to serve on the many agencies, boards and commissions that are in the province of Ontario. So, of course, they must first submit their interest by serving. Then there is an interview process. Then there is a police record check. Then there is an order in council. Then, and most importantly for the members opposite, there is a standing committee on government agencies. You may be familiar with it. It does have the opportunity to review the attended appointments of persons to agencies, boards, and commissions. That opportunity was provided twice with the member involved. You know, I, I find it frustrating that people who want to serve their public are automatically suggesting by the member opposite that Response. if they support Premier Ford, if they support our government, they should automatically disqualify. Well, guess what? There are a lot of people who support Premier Ford in the province of Ontario, and many of them want to be part of the solution by serving as their couldn't hear the Solicitor General. Order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate that answer from the Solicitor General, because in 2018, we did call for Mr. Chatha to appear before the Government Agencies Committee Board, and the PCs didn't allow it to happen. Now the Premier is campaigning with him after giving him a three-year contract renewal at the Peel Police Services Board. And police services is a bit different. There is, should be a definite, a definite separation Order. between politics and civilian oversight of the police. And if it was wrong for the member from Peterborough, then I don't see why the government doesn't have a policy on it and why, why do we have to find out in pictures that this is being done? Why? Because police oversight, civilian Question. oversight of police is a different matter than many other appointments. Thank you, Speaker. 
Government House Speaker. But maybe it's just me, Speaker, but I find it kind of creepy that the NDP are searching through pictures to see who they can find uh, at uh, different uh, events, Mr. Speaker. How about they spend their time worrying about how to build a strong economy for the people of the province of Ontario, Speaker? I guess that is why they are so disappointed when they hear that the jobs are coming back to the province of Ontario. And we've done it, Mr. Speaker, since 2018. Look, at we were elected on a promise to reignite the Ontario economy, an economy that had suffered because of the policies of the Liberals and the NDP, an economy that was over-regulated. Red tape. We had more red tape in the province of Ontario than any other jurisdiction, not just by a little bit, but by twice as much. We started to eliminate that. We, made, we put in place uh, uh, the policies that would bring jobs back to the province of Ontario. Now, the job is not done, Mr. Speaker, and the people of the province of Ontario know that. They know that, and they know that the only way to continue what we have started in 2018 to ensure that our economy continues to grow is Response. to elect a strong, stable, conservative majority government on June the 2nd, and I am very confident that they will do just that. Next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Yesterday, the Minister of Health admitted that the Conservative government doesn't care about Brampton's health care system. She said herself that she doesn't believe that Brampton, a order. city of over 700,000 people, the Let's ninth largest city in Canada, one of the fastest growing, doesn't deserve three hospitals. Let's be clear. Brampton deserved a second hospital 10 years ago, and Brampton deserves a third hospital today. So will the Minister of Health admit that she was wrong and that Brampton does require three hospitals, and more importantly, will she commit to the funding today to make it happen? For Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the member opposite, for the question. I'm delighted to talk about Brampton because this government is getting it done for Brampton. As part of our plan to build a stronger, more resilient health care system that is better uh, prepared to respond to crisis, Ontario government is investing $21 million to expand William Osler Health System. The funding will help transform Peel Memorial into a new inpatient hospital with 24-7 emergency department and expand cancer care at Brampton Civic Hospital. These projects will improve access to much-needed services in Brampton so that local families continue to receive the high-quality care that they need and deserve close to home. For decades, previous governments, supported by the NDP and the, the members of the opposition, uh, the coalition, previous governments uh, supported, aided and abetted by your members uh, didn't and do anything for Brampton, but this government is getting it done for Brampton. Here, here. And the to the minister, let's look at how badly Brampton is being left behind. Windsor is a city of over 200,000 people and they have two hospitals. Hamilton is a city of around 600,000 people, Order. and they have three hospitals. Mississauga is a city of over 800,000 people, and they have three hospitals. I want to ask the Conservative Minister of Health Order. to name me another city in Canada that has over 700,000 people and only one hospital. Brampton is the only city in the entire country that is being left behind in such a terrible way, and the Conservative government is allowing it to happen. And now on top of it, they're denying that our city and our residents want better. Well, Bramptonians do deserve better, and we in the NDP are going to fight to make it happen. So will the Conservative Minister of Health admit that she was wrong, that Bramptonians do deserve three hospitals, and more importantly, commit to the funding today to make sure that our city has three hospitals Question. with three emergency rooms? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite. It is great to be able to talk about all the great things that we're doing in Brampton. As part of our 2021 budget, the government announced $18 million to expand Peel Memorial Urgent Care Centre to 24-7 operations while awaiting plans for the new inpatient hospital. Today, the government is building on that investment. We've got uh, another $18 million with the new 24-7 emer emergency department, new inpatient hospital services, enhanced seniors' care, mental health and addiction rehabilitation, complex continuing care for patients and their families in Brampton, which is what we all want to see, making sure Brampton has the care that they deserve. Let, let me just quote the um, uh, chair of William Order Osler Health System. Uh, the announcement is a momentous step forward for Osler and the future of health care in our community. As Brampton and surrounding regions continue to grow, Response. Osler is committed to building a strong, vibrant hospital system that will bring innovative, life-saving care to patients for years to come. I know the people of Brampton are happy that this government is getting it done. 
The final supplementary. Thank you. Back to the minister. The Conservative Minister of Health had the audacity to say that Bramptonians don't deserve three hospitals. Does that mean that the Conservative MPPs from Brampton are not advocating for the people of Brampton who clearly want three hospitals? Does that mean Order. that the Conservative MPPs Order. themselves are not advocating for three hospitals in Brampton? Because if the Conservative government spoke to the people of Brampton, they would hear how people are struggling the government with one side emergency room that is chronically overcrowded. The fact that people in Brampton are struggling being treated in the hallways in the thousands because there's not enough space. The fact that for some surgeries like hip replacements, wait times are twice as long in Brampton. Despite all of this, does the Minister of Health, the Conservative Minister of Health, still believe that Brampton doesn't deserve three hospitals? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for this question. The Minister of Health has done an incredible job focusing on the places uh, where we need to enhance hospital care, and that is why we're doing so much in Brampton. We have already delivered a lot. Uh, the mayor of Brampton was quoted as, as saying that what we're doing is a huge step in the right direction, actually six Three. times larger than the original project that was planned only a few years before that. This government is enhancing all of the work uh, that we can offer to Brampton to make and deliver the best health care possible for the people of Brampton, thanks to the excellent advocacy by the member of Brampton South and the member of Brampton West, who have done a great job to make sure this government delivers for Brampton. Thank you very much. Order. Order. Come inside, come to order. Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries will come to order. Sorry. Member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the government House Leader. Speaker, six weeks ago, Bill 88, our London Family Act, was referred to the Standing Committee on Justice Policy without having been debated in this legislature. The bill is named to honour four beloved members of London's Afzal family who were murdered in a horrific Islamophobic attack on June 6, 2021. It was developed by the official opposition in partnership with the National Council of Canadian Muslims to channel the collective grief, trauma and anger of the Muslim community and all Ontarians into real action against Islamophobic hate. Speaker, there are mere days left before this legislature must dissolve. My question is, when will our London Family Act be called before this Assembly so it can be passed into law before the election? Government House Leader to reply. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Look, as I've uh, mentioned to uh, the member opposite, uh, uh, it is our belief that the bill needs uh, more work in order to strengthen it, uh, Mr. Speaker. It is too important. What we saw happen in London, I think we all agree, uh, it was, uh, uh, was a tragedy and that there is a tremendous amount of work that we have to do as, uh, as legislators uh, to ensure that, uh, that we honour that, that we respect that, and that we work to uh, not only Islamophobia but all forms of racism. So, uh, as I have mentioned again to the, to the member opposite uh, on numerous occasions, we think that the bill needs to be strengthened in the current format. It does not uh, uh, do what, uh, uh, what I think we all collectively want, want it to do. So, the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism has been working directly with, uh, with with stakeholders uh, to ensure that the bill gets strengthened. Look, it doesn't end just because uh, an election is called, Mr. Speaker. There will be new people sitting in this legislature. There will be new people sitting in this le legislature uh, after June the 2nd, and they will ensure that the proper bill, a strengthened bill, uh, and a bill that meets the needs Order. of the community uh, and the spirit of what the community wants is brought forward and passed. Supplementary question. Speaker. The government House Leader just said that Bill 86 is not coming back before this legislature. This is a bill that sets out a detailed, concrete plan to tackle Islamophobia, white supremacy and organized hate in our province. Thousands of emails have been sent urging the government to support the plan. We need to move beyond words to meaningful action. We need to learn from the lessons of our tragedies and work together to do everything possible to prevent more deaths. 
Muslims in Ontario and around the world are observing and celebrating the holy month of Ramadan. MPPs have the opportunity to make systemic, lasting changes to address Islamophobia, hate and racism in our province. Will this government commit to this assembly with a specific date for our London Family Act to be called and debated so it can become law in Ontario? Respond. Again, the government house leader. Mr. Speaker, it may be good enough for the opposition to pass a bill that does not meet the needs of the communities that is not strong enough. It is simply not good enough for the government of Ontario. We want a bill. Order. We want to pass a bill that meets the needs of the community that respects what happened in London and makes real progress and takes action. The Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism Order. has been working directly with stakeholders, Mr. Speaker. Now, I don't know why it is that the opposition assumes that on June the 2nd, we just stop talking about uh, uh, racism in this place, about improving uh, the province of Ontario. I know on our side of the House, it doesn't stop on June the 2nd, Mr. Speaker, but I simply will not allow a bill to pass that does not meet the needs of the community, that does not live up to what the community wanted uh, uh, to come out of it, Mr. Opposition Speaker. Come we, to will order. Ensure, we will ensure that we continue order. to work uh, with the stakeholders and that when a bill Response. comes back, it does exactly what the community wanted it to do, Mr. Speaker, respects the tragedy that happened in London and a bill that we can all be proud of. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. For years, residents in Mississauga have hoped to be, bit, to, to be better connected to transit that will get them where they need to go. That's why I was excited when our government announced its support for the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension. This rapid transit line would connect the Mississauga Transit Way to Toronto Rapid Transit System. Speaker Stephen Del Duca spent four years as a transportation minister and the people of the GTA did not see any transformational transit projects. While the Del Duca Wayne Liberal sat on their hands and didn't make it easy for people to get from point A to point B, this government is finally getting it done. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation please tell the House about the government's Question. progress on building the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension? The Associate Minister for Transportation, responsible for the GTA. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills. I know he works his tail off for his constituents. Speaker, I'm glad to let that member know that earlier this week, we did something huge. We officially started the tunneling at Eglinton Crosstown West Extension. A huge milestone for the seven-stop extension will bring reliable, modern, rapid transit to the communities of Etobicoke and Mississauga. The extension is estimated to support as many as 4,700 jobs during construction annually and within 20 years, attract 37,000 wow. daily boardings. Speaker, when the extension is complete, there will be a continuous rapid transit line along Eglinton Avenue from Scarborough to Etobicoke. That's part of our $28.5 billion GTA transit plan, the largest transit expansion in Canadian history. Speaker, for 15 years, the Liberal and NDP coalition said no to delivering any sort of transit for the people of Toronto and Mississauga to get around. Our government is doing what that coalition failed to do because after decades of inaction from the opposition, we're getting it done. Supplementary question. Thank you for the Associate Minister for your response and for this terrific news for the people of Etobicoke and Mississauga. Speaker, the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension will make it easier for people to get across the city of Toronto. By helping moving people faster, families can spend more time on what matters most, time with their loved ones. Despite this, Speaker, the Liberals and the NDP has, have again and again and again voted against our government's historic plans for transit. In fact, I do not believe Stephen Del Duca or the Leader of the Opposition have committed to any of our transit projects in their party platforms. How can Ontarians believe the Liberals or NDP are serious about building transit? Can the Associate Minister explain how this government's historic transit plans will benefit the people of Ontario and the danger of what would happen if we moved backward on transit? The Associate Minister. 
So, Speaker, that's a very fair question because the Liberals and NDP voted against our government's Getting Ontario Moving Act and Building Transit Faster Act. In other words, they said no to building the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension, no to reducing gridlock and em emissions, no to community benefits, no to construction jobs, and no to transit for the people of Etobicoke and Mississauga. Speaker, they also voted against all four of our subway projects. And with an election coming, we still don't hear a peep from the Liberals or the NDP on their transit plans. Maybe they're not committed to the Scarborough subway extension as well. Maybe they'd cancel both the Ontario line and the Young North subway extension to Richmond Hill. Speaker, with Stephen Del Duca building upside down bridges and the NDP saying no to homegrown transit jobs Order. for our subway projects, they clearly can't build transit, Speaker. Well, our government is building transit. We're doing it the right way because we Order. said yes to community benefits, yes to jobs, yes to transit-oriented communities, yes to reducing emissions, yes to cutting gridlock, all while helping people get from point A to point B. Why, Speaker? Because we're getting things done for the people of this province. The next question, the member for Kiewet Norm. Speaker, it's a good morning. My question is to the Premier. Um, the Sulukot Mini Aoun Health Center uh, operates a 20 bed long term care facility. If you live in Kiwetnu, the wait for a bed is between three and five years. The long term care bed shortage is forcing uh, elders to go hundreds of kilometers away. Thunder Bay and Fort Francis are still very far from home. For people in Toronto, this would be like sending your parent to. Sudbury or Ottawa. This is very far from their homes and it isolates them from their family, language, and their way of life. Speaker, uh, Minyawan has been uh, asking for years for these desperately needed long term care beds. I know this government listens, but when is this government going to hear us? The government has to uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the uh, question from the Honourable uh, uh, Member. I've actually already approved uh, an allocation of 76 new beds uh, uh, in Kiwetanung and uh, Minneyawan. Supplementary question. Uh, speaker, uh, the long term care ratio um, in Kiwetanung is like one bed for every 1,500 people. I know. Uh, the, the minister just announced it, that they approved the, the beds. But, you know, uh, I know words are good, but we need action. Because if we get those beds, it'll be one bed for every 300 people. I know that uh, it keeps reaffirming the election promise of a 676 bed facility in Sulakot. Again, it's been four years. Again, the, the, there's no movement on the file. It seems that the government, even the uh, Minneyawan, has even heard about this announcement. When is this government going to make this good on this promise to the people of Kiwetnuk to expand the facility? Mr. Longford, Again, Mr. Speaker, we've, uh, we have made the, the allocation uh, for there, but, it, it, but he's right. The uh, uh, long-term care in Northern Ontario was something that was uh, greatly ignored by the previous government, in fact, uh, uh, in, indeed by the NDP as well when they had held the balance of power. So in order to fix that, Mr. Speaker, we knew that we had to make some serious uh, changes and bring some beds uh, uh, to the north. So in Temiskaming and Cochrane, uh, I've allocated 46 new beds, 82 upgraded beds. In Algoma, Manitoulin, uh, an Indigenous allocation of 96 new beds, uh, another allocation of 37 beds and 59 upgraded beds. In Kenora, Rainy River, a new allocation of 64 uh, beds, uh, as well uh, as in Kenora, 64 new beds, 96 upgraded beds. Kuwetnam, 76 beds. Uh, in uh, Muskegawak, James Bay, uh, 32 new beds I allocated. In Thunder Bay, I allocated 96 uh, new beds. And because he mentioned uh, uh, Sudbury, I've allocated Response. 92 new beds and 644 upgraded beds for Sudbury. And in Nickel Belt, uh, we're upgrading 256 beds to brand new, uh, brand new facilities with modern standards. The next question, the member for York Centre. 
Speaker, my question is to the Solicitor General. In the last four years, we've seen this government consistently attack our democratic rights. It forced businesses to post political slogans. It made it difficult to hold itself accountable in court with the Crown Liabilities Proceedings Act. It invoked and passed Section 33, the notwithstanding clause, to overturn a court that was worried that the government's elections reform may benefit the government. Bill 100, which currently awaits royal assent, is a further assault on Ontario's democracy. Section 9 empowers the Register of Motor Vehicles to make orders and suspend permits without a hearing. Bill 100 denies basic due process and the presumption of innocence. Will the Solicitor General respect our charter and not send Bill 100 for royal assent? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, when the member has an opportunity to review the debates that participated in Bill 100, he will see that, in fact, Bill 100 is very scoped, and it is all about protecting international borders so that Ontario can continue to be a leader in our economic powerhouse. You know, we have made investments that are, frankly, unprecedented in the history of Ontario, with Solantis in Windsor, with our car manufacturers in, in Windsor, in uh, Oshawa, in Oakville, in Woodstock. The, the amount of work that we are doing to signal to the international community that Ontario is open for business and wants people to invest in the province of Ontario is exactly why we needed Bill 100, because we want to send a message. We're open for business. Come to Ontario, invest in Ontario, and you will have a government that has your back. The supplementary question. Speaker, the right to liberty is enshrined by Section 7 of the Charter. The presumption of innocence, one of our democracy's most sacred rights, arises out of Section 7 and our right to liberty. Despite what the Solicitor General says, the explanatory note to Bill 100, as drafted by the legislative lawyer, states Order. that Section 9 empowers Order. the Registrator to make orders suspending plates, licenses, and permits without a hearing. Government side, come to order. Speaker, Bill 100 expressly denies due process and the presumption of innocence. It allows the government to convict and punish Ontarians without a trial. This is another assault by this government on our democratic rights. I ask the Solicitor General again, will she respect our democracy and not submit Bill 100 for royal assent? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. I think everyone in this House understands and appreciates that Ontario has a very strong history of allowing and ensuring the right for people to protest and share their opinion publicly in a public forum. What we are protecting in Bill 100 with a very scoped piece of legislation is to ensure international borders, trade, bear, trade uh, pathways are allowed to remain open. You know, in a very short period of time, six days in Windsor, we were impacting literally hundreds of workers, hundreds of businesses that had to either ramp back their production or, in fact, stop it. Bill 100, in a scoped way, is going to ensure that that never happens again in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, when our government formed, we saw the state that the previous governments have led long-term care in. Speaker, from 2011 to 2018, while the, the Duca Liberals, propped up by NDP, only managed to build 611 net new beds across the entire province, that is an increase of only 0.8 percent, while the population of Ontarians aged 75 and over grew by 20 percent. Speaker, that is 611 beds for over 176,000 people. I know my constituents in Dalmany North and all Ontarians are counting on our governments to fix long-term care in Ontario. And I know our government has committed to building 30,000 new long-term care beds in the province and we're developing thousands more. So, Speaker, through you, could the minister please tell us some locations where these beds are being built? Thank you. The member for Oakville, North Burlington. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for that excellent question from the member from Don Valley North. 
The member is right. The previous government's legacy in long-term care is one of neglect and massive wait lists for seniors waiting for long-term care beds. Our government wasted no time fixing the gaps in the sector that the previous government left behind. Earlier this month, our government announced projects in Etobicoke and North York that will see new and redeveloped beds for communities that desperately need them. Dom Lupa will see 22 upgraded beds for the Slovenian community through renovations in the existing building, resulting in a modernized 58-bed home. Eatonville Care Centre will add another 320 upgraded long-term care beds. And the project at North York General Hospital will see another 384 seniors with a new place to call home. Speaker, these projects bring our running total to 27,148 new and 23,504 upgraded beds in our development pipeline. Yeah, yeah. Question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for Pierre uh, Chandaferala's <laughs> response. Speaker, this these new beds will certainly help us seniors live in and it's in comfort in their uh, communities. But, Speaker, we have heard from Ontarians across the province that meeting the culture's need of our seniors is vital to ensuring their well-being. Speaker, back in March, I was pleased to join the minister when he announced 256 upgrade beds in the whole Chrome Seniors Homes Project. This home provides culturally appropriate care to the Armenian community in my riding up Down Valley North and across Toronto. Speaker, could the minister please tell us what else our government is doing to ensure that the cultural needs of our seniors in long-term care are met? Thank you, Speaker. And to reply, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again to the member for the question. Thanks to the advocacy of our PC Caucus members, our government has made it a priority to provide culturally appropriate long-term care in Ontario. We have the Mong Shang Homes in Markham and Stouffville that will provide care for the Chinese communities, thanks to my colleagues from Markham Unionville and Markham Thornhill. Well we have the Guru Nanak Long-Term Care Centre and the Indus Community Project for the South Asian communities, and that's thanks to our members in Brampton. <laughs> as well as the two new long-term care homes with 640 new beds approved for Oakville North Burlington, which will also provide culturally appropriate care for the South Asian community. We have the project at Villa Colombo, which will see 256 wow. upgraded beds for seniors in the Italian community, thanks to the member for Eglinton Lawrence, and of course the hundreds of beds we have allocated for our Francophone communities across Ontario, thanks to our Minister of what? Francophone Affairs and the members from Mississauga Centre. Speaker, our government understands and values meeting the cultural needs of seniors in long-term care, and we are getting it done. Next question, the member Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, you'll remember that a year ago Laurentian declared insolvency in Sudbury. They terminate more than 190 employees, and that created countless other job losses. They eliminate 36% of their programs. They cut 72 program speakers, including 29 cours de français. They affected the academic career plans of 932 students, and it was a terrible blow to my community. Yesterday, Speaker, the Auditor General tabled a report on Laurentian University. The Auditor wrote, and I'm quoting here, for its part, the ministry, the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, which is the primary government ministry responsible for monitoring the financial health of post-secondary institutions, did not proactively intervene in a timely manner to provide guidance to help Laurentian slow or ultimately respond to its worsening financial deterioration. Speaker, will the Premier agree with the Auditor General that the ministry did not proactively intervene to protect my community from Sudbury from all of this hardship? Thank you. <clears throat> The uh, Minister of Colleges and Universities to reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank you to the member for that question. And I want to thank the Auditor General for this preliminary report, and I know Ontarians are looking forward to seeing her final report. My top priority has and will always be ensuring post-secondary education uh, and students across the province are able to receive the world-class education institutions have to offer in this province. When Laurentian University made the decision to file for CCAA, we provided direct financial supports for students who needed to enroll at a new institution to continue their studies. 
Our go government also stepped up to replace the former debtor-in-possession loan lender and appointed five new members to the board to provide a stable pathway for Laurentian to reach a plan of arrangement with its creditors and assure that students that their education year would not be in jeopardy. Every action our government has taken and will continue to take will be in the best interest of students. The member for Nickelbelt, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of College and University. Speaker, my community has endured 14 months of hardship because of the CCWA process at Laurentian University. Will the minister agree to act proactively as recommended by the Auditors General to make sure that Laurentian University does not continue with the CCWA process? The auditor's report says, and I quote, there are certain principles held high in the public sector, including transparency, accountability, and the primacy of public interest. That makes the CCWA process, the court-ordered protection, a detrimental choice for public entities. Laurentian University should not have used the CCWA process. This process has gone on too long. It must end now. The government can and must get Laurentian University out of the CCWA process because before the court order date of May 31st, the ministry knows that CCWA is wrong. Will the minister put an end to it right now? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the, the question. And uh, I'd like to take the opportunity now, as Minister of Colleges and Universities, as the academic year is wrapping up for post-secondary education students in the province, to wish them the best of luck on their exams. I know I have three daughters who are uh, reaching exam time and uh, feeling the stress right now. Um, you know, as the Honour General stated in her report, Laurentian is an autonomous institution that has sole responsibility over its academic and administrative affairs. While my ministry has been working with Laurentian throughout this period, the decisions that they have made in regards to program offerings, staffing, and navigating the CCAA process have been at the sole discretion of the institution and its advisors. And as the CCAA process is still underway, it would be inappropriate for me to comment further at this time. But again, I want to thank the Auditor General for tabling her preliminary report, and we will continue to cooperate with her office throughout this process. Thank you. Members, next question. Member for Ottawa, Vanier. My question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, for the past 25 years, Ontario Francophones have built an education system with very high levels of success and high levels of admission, which continue to grow. And yet the government has not kept up, and there is a chronic shortage of teachers, and this threatens the very viability of the system. Moreover, there's contempt regarding the governance of school boards by bypassing the autonomy of, of French language school boards uh, online or on, by delaying urgent measures identified by the working group on the shortage of French language teachers. This government has jettisoned French language education. Will the minister listen to her own working group and will she commit to implementing all the recommendations on the shortage of teachers in the French language system? Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member opposite for the question. We would agree that there's been an explosion of interest uh, and enrollment within the French language uh, program in Ontario, which is a brilliant outcome, and it's something we support through investment, Speaker. It's why we've increased investment in French language education by $37 million this year alone. is the highest it has ever been in Ontario history. And, Speaker, to specifically address the question cited, the member opposite will know that this has been a national issue that has existed for well over 15 years, and it is regretful that the former Liberal government did not have the foresight to bring together Labour, school boards, uh, uh, faculties of education and government to devise a plan which our government announced, a $12.5 million program to, to incentivize more educators to enter, to retain them, and to recruit them internationally from the Francophonie. I'm actually very proud, Speaker, that for the first time, this working group and this initiative has produced uh, uh, educators from around the world who are now working within Ontario schools. We're going to continue to make this a priority to meet the needs of French language students today and well into the future. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, 
the Liberal Party did not undermine French language education in the same way as the Conservative government has done during its time in power. A number of recommendation, recommendations have come forward from the working group. Why does the minister refuse to work with French language universities in Ontario to create more spaces for teacher training? We have to underline that the government has allowed for the second largest uh, faculty of education to cut in its cut its programs on the basis of an, uh, an insolvability problem that the Auditor General has described as an unnecessary. You have to reform the system to better serve the program. You've re reduced the representation of French language teachers and French language educators in our language boards. Will the minister show greater respect to the province's French language education boards by ensuring by ensuring proper representation within the College of Teachers of French Language Educators. The conviction of the member opposite that we have to continue to recruit French language educators. It is a challenge that precedes our time in office, but we are resolved to get the job done and to fix it. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud that under the leadership of the Minister of Francophone Affairs, we now have UOF and Hearst as two independent governed Francophone universities for the French community, by the French community. That is important progress, and of course, in our high schools and elementary schools, we've increased investment, increased resources, and of course, hired more French language teachers, so much so that we are now literally recruiting from the Francophonie. We have educators for the first time from France, part of this agreement, working with the Ontario schools. There is clearly more work to do. Together with the minister and our premier, we will all continue enterprise-wide in this government to ensure French language students, the preservation and the linguistic uh, preservation of their history, their language, and their culture remains true in the hearts and the curriculum of our schools, of our curriculum, and Response. across our province. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, we all know that Ontario is facing a housing crisis driven by a severe shortage of homes. The housing supply shortage impacts all Ontarians, regardless of where they live or their budget. But, Speaker, our government has made significant progress to build more housing for Ontarians who simply need a little bit of help. But unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, it seems that members opposite have trouble understanding the concept of supply and demand. So through you, Speaker, could the minister tell us how creating more housing will help Ontarians who are simply trying to realize the dream of home ownership. Thanks, uh, Speaker. And I want to thank the, uh, the member from flamborough glanbrook for her incredible advocacy uh, on the housing file. Uh, Speaker, our government is using every resource at our disposal to build more housing of all types, of all shapes and all sizes. Recently, I, uh, I made an announcement with the uh, Mayor of Vaughan that our government is providing surplus lands there uh, to a non-profit housing provider uh, at a location that is really, Speaker, it's a, it's a beautiful spot. Uh, it's ideal because it's close to amenities, to public transit. It really is going to be a, a wonderful development. We're also, uh, Speaker, not going to sit on our hands when it comes to surplus properties. We're making better use of them to be able to advance the priorities of Ontarians, uh, which was just exactly what that announcement in Vaughan was, was all about. We're also providing nearly $1.2 billion to our community and our Indigenous partners Response. to build thousands of supportive housing units and deliver on services in all corners of the province. I, I, I'm very excited, uh, Speaker, to hear the supplemental because I've got lots more that our government's doing. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and of course, we're all anxious to hear it. Speaker, our government continues to make historic investments in housing and homelessness. We are also making these programs more sustainable and efficient over the long term. We are ensuring that every single taxpayer dollar counts and is being put to its best use, unlike the wasteful previous Liberal government. One pillar of addressing housing is dealing with homelessness. So through you, back to the minister, how is that ministry and our government working to improve housing and homelessness programming? Great question. 
Thanks, Speaker. Uh, unlike the previous government that ignored the housing file for 15 years, our government is actually trying to improve the opportunities for housing supply in Ontario. And, and you know, Speaker, I'm going to be very interested to see how the members opposite vote on Bill 109 in a few yeah, moments. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah, continually yeah. our government has brought forward very pragmatic, forward-thinking policies to get shovels in the ground faster. We realize, Speaker, unlike the opposition, that, that dealing with the housing supply crisis is a long-term strategy. It needs long-term collaboration and cooperation from all three levels of government. And I'll, I'll tell you something, Speaker. The official opposition and the Liberal Party are going to get their chance. They're going to get their chance to stand with us, to stand for that couple that wants to realize the dream of homeownership, that senior that wants to downsize. We've got a plan, more homes for everyone. I'm looking forward to seeing the vote in a few minutes, Speaker. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I have often stood in this House and asked for provincial government support towards the ongoing devastating flooding situations in York Southwestern. Homeowners continue to be frustrated with inaction from the province as they yet again deal with flooded basements and emotional uh, distrust that occurs. I have reached out to all three levels of government for support, and back in March, I outlined my concerns in a letter to the Minister of the Environment. Uh, Rockcliffe Ravine Flood uh, Mitigation Project is seemingly a quick-fix solution that does nothing to address the ongoing building and land user development along well-documented flood plains. When will this government join their municipal and federal partners in investing both the time and money for proper flooding mitigation that residents so dearly need? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank, uh, I thank that member opposite for the question, a very important one. Uh, Speaker, we understand uh, the impact that climate change is having, extreme weather events and flooding. I hail from a community that, along Lake Ontario, uh, like that member, and I know how important this is. Uh, so I would say that's why this government was the first government in Ontario's history to launch a comprehensive climate change impact assessment, working with municipalities, upper and lower tier, uh, to build climate change resiliency. Uh, furthermore, Speaker, I was uh, I joined Mayor Tory uh, in Toronto uh, to make strategic investments long term, because you see, there's a fundamental difference between uh, the members opposite and this government. We understand that we need to plan for growth. We need to make the necessary investments to build resiliency, to plan for growth long term, and we're doing that, and I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Through you, uh, my question is back to the Premier. I have yet to receive a response from the Environmental Ministry regarding my letter on flooding, and in fact, uh, residents that did receive a response on an ongoing environmental air quality issue was extremely disappointed with the reply they received. Residents have made it very clear that the flooding mitigation efforts seem not well planned and short on provincial investment. The Toronto Regional Conservation Authority has identified the flooding plain in York Southwestern as one of the highest risk flood plains in the jurisdictions, yet the province has not spent any of their own money. When I see nearby communities receiving financial support, and rightfully so, I'm left wondering why residents who have suffered ongoing flooding damage in York Southwestern are neglected and not treated equally by this government would like an answer here today when they can expect the assistance Question. and attention they require from this government. Minister of the Environment. Thank you again, and thank you to that member opposite, and uh, perhaps we could speak after and, and discuss the specific issue there. I will say uh, climate change and climate change-related events don't treat all Ontarians equally. That's why we launched the Climate Change Impact Assessment. The member opposite also mentioned air, and we've got some members on our team at MECP here today who work diligently, diligently on the most comprehensive SO2, sulfur-related uh, you know, regulations in Ontario's history. After years where Liberal members stood by idly and saw nothing, we worked with industry, with the tremendous leadership of MPP Bob Bailey to get it done with Amjadong First Nation. 
We've launched a climate change impact assessment working with Meritori to provide much needed supports. He appreciated that. Uh, the, we were joined by Councillor McKelvey and a number of others who appreciated the work that the province is taking to look long term because that's the difference between the Liberal NDP Response. coalition and the per strong, stable Conservative government. We're planning for growth, making record transit investments, launching the first and most comprehensive climate change impact assessment, and we're not going to stop. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the government house leader. This week, the government didn't give much of a legislative agenda or schedule, as per uh, Standing Order 59, to all of the MPPs of this House. It goes without saying that notice of when bills will be debated and voted on is a fundamental aspect of the parliamentary process and the democratic process. Last night, Bill 100 was called for debate, after hours, without notice, to all MPPs. On that note, I would like to congratulate the member for Chatham-Kent Leamington for maintaining a very friendly relationship with the same government that he claims his party is challenging, as he received both notice of last night's debate and had the House Leader defend him during question period yesterday. My question for the House Leader is, will the House be resuming for legislative matters after next week's constituency week, and does he plan on holding further evening sittings without notice? House Leader. Well, Speaker, I mean, look, I... I, I... I could have been clearer. I think it was three weeks ago that I tabled a motion that said that we would be having night sittings uh, going forward in order to, to deal with government legislation. There were members on all sides of the House who were here. There were some great speeches from the members of the NDP. The member for Chatham, Kent Leamington, had a great speech. I didn't really agree with it, and I think he, under, he appreciates that. It can't be the government House leader's job to also do the scheduling for the New Blue Party. It, it can't possibly be. Now, if, if New Blue can't even, can't even schedule their time, how in God's name do they expect to, to, to run a province, Mr. Speaker? Like, I am sorry. I will do my best from now on. If you want to send your schedule to me, I'll see if we can't help you schedule your time. But when we say that the House is sitting, Response. we expect that members will want to be here to debate what is before the House. Everybody else can do it. I'm not sure why the member can't. I remind members we don't make uh, reference to the absence of other members. Uh, member for Cambridge, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. In February, the government rewrote the law to delay tabling their 2022 budget for two months after it was required by the law. The budget is a fundamental, fundamental part of responsible and good government, Mr. Speaker. It is important that Ontarians know how their hard-earned tax dollars are being spent. We haven't had a budget from this government in over a year as it continues its reckless spending and greater deficits than anything seen by the prior Liberal government. I don't see any other legislative matters on the docket for this session, Speaker, so I would like to know how the House, from the House Leader, does this government plan on still tabling a budget prior to the next election, yes or no? And to reply, the Minister of Finance. Well, uh, thank you to the member opposite through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the House Leader who you should look right sometimes. I know, you, <laughs> I know that's your tendency. Uh, before I answer that question, I do want to say it's been an honour and a privilege to, uh, to stand in this House, uh, all 124 of us. It's been the privilege of my life, so thank you very much. But I will uh, add that I plan to be here uh, <laughs> for more years. That is the plan. We have a plan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've worked hard for four years. Uh, you know, obviously, we inherited a health care system that needed to be fixed, a, a long-term care system that needed to be fixed. We needed to invest in broadband. We needed to invest in housing. We needed to invest in public transit. We need to invest in highways. So, Mr. Speaker, um, stay tuned. Restez à l'écoute. The budget will be. Coming. Stay tuned. Okay. Next question: the Member for Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Chief Medical Officer of Health confirmed that Ontario is in a sixth wave of COVID-19 infections. Cases are on the rise in the communities, and hospitalization due to COVID are increasing in many parts of the province. At the same time, we have seen the Premier abandon public health measures that will slow down transmission of the virus in communities. Speaker, allowing COVID to run rampant through Ontario will be detrimental to the most vulnerable people in our society. As the situation changes in Ontario, it is quick 
that the government's job to ensure they react quickly to protect the public health. Will the Premier reassess the rolling back of public health protections in the face of the new wave? The member for Angleton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. In Ontario, we have taken a cautious and phased approach to removing public health measures, and we expected, when we started to remove them, indicators uh, such as cases and hospitalizations to increase um, as in Ontarians interact more with each other. However, uh, thanks to our very high vaccination rates, the amount of natural immunity out there, as well as the arrival of the antiviral medications, Ontario has the tools necessary to manage the impact of the virus. And uh, Dr. Moore said just a few weeks ago, we have the tools we didn't have just a few years ago, just two years ago, including highly effective vaccines that have changed the course of the pandemic, the high vaccination rates that continue to improve as more and more Ontarians see the value of getting boosted, and the antiviral drugs that I mentioned. Fine. Those are remdesivir and Paxlovid. So those uh, medications are there. We think we're managing the, uh, the impact of the virus, and we will continue to do so. Supplementary question. Again, to the Premier, we know that one of the best protections out there against COVID is wearing a properly fitted mask. We also know that N95 respirators offer people the best protection against catching and spreading COVID-19. For months, this government has been mandating that hospitals and long-term care facilities and other high-risk settings require visitors to put on a three-ply medical mask when entering these premises. The CDC recently changed its masking policy to require hospitals to allow individuals to use respirators with higher levels of protection if they chose. It makes no sense to disarm people and lower their level of protection against infections. Will the Premier revise and update Ontario's policy? For Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite. As always, uh, this government is listening to the Chief Medical Officer of Health, who continues to re review all of the data at all times, along with the minister and other people within the Ministry of Health, to make sure that we're doing everything uh, we can to ensure the safety and well-being of the people of Ontario, and we will continue to do that. We have, as I said, tools that we've never had before to protect people. And one of the great stories of this pandemic is that this government, uh, under the leadership of Premier, uh, the Premier, decided right at the beginning that we would never let ourselves not have enough PPE, and this government did something about it. Currently, 46 per cent of Ontario's PPE needs are met domestically, and within 18 months, 93 per cent of Ontario's PPE needs will be met domestically, and that is a Spons. great success story thanks to the leadership of this government in getting it done. The next question, the member for Scarborough, Gildewood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In 2018, the Ontario Liberal government budgeted $1.1 billion for investments in Scarborough Hospital. It's now grown to $1.5 billion as it has sat in the Treasury for four years under this Conservative government. After so much silence and delay from this government, the Scarborough Health Network submitted a revised plan last year to invest $1.9 billion in Birchmount and Centenary hospitals. This will result in a 30 per cent increase in beds capacity in Scarborough. Ontario Liberals said yes and committed to SHN's revised plan to the people of Scarborough as we always have. Speaker, why has it taken this government and their Scarborough members four years to commit to Scarborough health care? Why is it that now, mere days away from an election, there is still not a single shovel Question. in the ground? The government house leader. Speaker, let's, 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 let's hear what the member just said. Basically, what the member said is, had they had a fifth mandate, they would have got around to taking care of Scarborough. So they didn't have time to do it from 2003, and they didn't have time in 2004. By 2013, they still hadn't had time to concentrate on Scarborough. 
2017, they didn't have time to concentrate on Scarborough, but in a couple of days before an election, unbudgeted with nothing in it, all of a sudden they thought, oh, we made better pay attention to Scarborough. But I tell you what, we started paying attention from day one. Day one, we brought them a new medical school to Scarborough. We got them a three-stop uh, three subway to Scarborough. Of course, over four mandates, they couldn't get that done. And today. We made an enormous announcement for the people of Scarborough, Mr. Speaker, an enormous announcement for the people of Scarborough. It didn't take us five mandates. It didn't take Response. us 15 years. It's taking us one mandate, Mr. Speaker, because we're getting it done for Scarborough. Supplementary question. Speaker, um, I believe you said back to me. I didn't hear that. but. Uh, our hospitals, like SHN, do their best each and every day, and I want to thank our health care workers. They do their best, for instance, to help victims of gun violence. I've talked to emergency room doctors, and they have said to me that they are tired of stitching people out, up and sending them back into the same environment. I find it extremely disappointing that this government does not take the health impacts of gun violence seriously. Just moments ago, this House had an opportunity to provide leadership by moving Bill 60, a bill that would address the health gap that communities are coping with due to the effects of gun violence. Through to third reading, we could have passed this bill today. However, Question. the UC was denied by the government side of the House. Speaker, people are suffering, like Safiuli Khosrawi's parents, who I have met. How can we stand here and just be indifferent in the face of such suffering? How can you say no, Government House Leader, to passing Bill 60? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the member opposite, for the question. Honestly, the people of Scarborough deserve better. I've always said that, and I'm so delighted to see that this government is making significant investments in Scarborough. As the Government House Leader just indicated, this government has started the subway in Scarborough, which they waited forever for. This government got it done. Uh, as, the, as the government house leader just mentioned, we, we've started a medical school in Scarborough at U of T. This government got that done. And as the, as the government house leader just mentioned, there is an announcement, an important announcement today in Scarborough. This government is getting it done for health care in Scarborough. This government has made all kinds of investments. Unfortunately, for 15 years, the opposition, aided and abetted by the NDP, the Liberal opposition, did nothing. They did nothing to get it done. This government is getting it done for the residents of Scarborough Response. because we care. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. The member for Sudbury has a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I rise on a point of order just to correct my record. Uh, yesterday, I was speaking about uh, the recent passing of Paul Falkowski during the member from uh, Timmins' uh, motion. I inadvertently said that the member from Timmins worked with Paul Falkowski and Elliott Lake. They worked together as steelworkers. The member from Timmins worked at Elliott Lake. The member from, uh, uh, Paul Falkowski worked at. Uh, uh, I apologize. Member Timmins worked in the Timmins uranium mines. The member uh, Paul Falkowski worked at uh, Elliott Lake uranium mine. I'll write it for Hansard. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Member for London West has a point of order. Uh, yes, thank you, Speaker. The uh, government House Leader mentioned the debate last night, and I want to acknowledge our colleague, the member for Hamilton Mountain, who spoke on uh, the act to proclaim the month of June as Myasthenia Gravis Month, uh, and she shared her very powerful moving and emotional words about her own experience with that uh, with that condition and uh, it was really a, an extraordinary moment in this legislature and i encourage all members to uh, if you have the opportunity to watch the video of that debate it was uh, we were very proud of our member for hamilton mountain I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 9G, the Clerk received written notice from the Government House Leader indicating that a temporary change in the weekly meeting schedule of the House is required, and therefore the afternoon routine on Wednesday, April 27, 2022, shall commence at 1 p.m. Next we have a deferred vote 
on a motion for closure on the motion for third reading of Bill 106, an act to enact two acts and amend various other acts. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell. 